who I haven't had the privilege to meet, my name is Rhys Griffiths and I am Dear Industry New Zealand's Market Manager for Asia with the primary responsibility of the Velva Markets. For today I've been asked to give a presentation or we update. So this is the Velva session, it's about 45 minutes long or 40 minutes long and I'm going to split that into two. So I'm going to give a wee update on, um, on the Velva Markets of where, where we're at and, and how things are going. And then I'm going to ask for the sort of three key exporters. Um, Colin Ste you'll know most of them, all of them. Colin Stevenson from CK, Ross Chambers from Provelco, and Tony Cochran from PGG Rights, and to come up on stage and provide a bit of an interactive panel. Um, I find those guys are able to give some better answers than, than I may be able to, um, given that they're that close to the market. So I'll just spend a little bit of time just going through the outline of my presentation. So I'm going to be going through a bit of a, it's broken into three key sections, a review of the season, how do we go and what were the key factors that um, impacted the season that we've just had, the current risks, and these are incredibly um, important to be quite mindful of, and then on to the opportunities, which um, is, a, is a larger part of my, uh, of my discussion today. So for our, um, for our review section, it's, it's pretty simple really. We, we end up having another really good year. It was the seventh year of, um, of good returns. Prices have held on the significant rises that we had achieved in the previous year, giving us a seventh year of stability. Over the last year, we have seen the biggest improvements to market access, certainly in my time since I've been at Dear Industry New Zealand. We've made significant strides in market positioning and our focus in the healthy food sector, which many of you guys would have heard me talking about over, over recent years, um, is really gaining momentum. But I put this slide here because this is what really mattered a lot um, and, and why prices were so, well, where prices, why prices remain so stable again, is that we had a little bit of luck coming into the season. And as most of you will note, um, there's good old Kiwi dollars and, and US dollars, you know, of which a, a lot of New Zealand velvet is traded in. So where things left off the previous season and where we started off last season, we had at least a 15, around about maybe even a 17% um, decline in the New Zealand dollar. And in part, this really helped um, to offset the downward pressure felt in China. And it's important to know where that downward pressure was coming from. The pressure to reduce prices in China was coming from the, the crackdown on corruption, from the crackdown on excessive gift giving, which did have an impact on some high value health items. And these high value health items included the highly valued velvet and gift boxes, which a lot of um, product you know, from regrowth or sp uh, spike of velvet particularly end up. And while we're talking about China, and it was really interesting to hear uh, Mike Peterson talking this morning about it, there was a lot of negative comments that were coming through lately last year on its, eco on its economy. And I was getting rung by farmers and by exporters saying, gee, things don't look too good. Well, that, that economy, it may not be growing at 9 or 10 or 11 percent as it has done, but as Mike said this morning, it's still forecasted to grow at 6.7 percent. That's an incredibly enviable position that I think most Western markets would be really happy to grow at. Further to that, the well-respected global analyst company, McKinsey, um, McKinsey Group, said in a report that they released just last month that the number of Chinese households earning over $25,000 per year will grow from 4% only a couple of years ago to over half the households by 2030. This is a market worth backing. And on to our other big uh, velvet market, South Korea. I am absolutely wrapped, or I was absolutely wrapped to see the New Zealand-Korean Free Trade Agreement implemented in December, which then celebrated its first anniversary just one month later on the 1st of January. This gave us two bites at the cherry during that season. These negotiators were incredibly clever at what they did, and we were running a real risk of not meeting that 1st of December deadline. So we had to meet that 1st of December deadline so we could get that other cut on the 1st of January. For New Zealand Velvet, the free trade agreement is really meaningful as it provides a competitive advantage that other countries who have negotiated free trade agreements with South Korea have completely missed out on. China, Australia, Canada, they didn't get any velvet across the line. So it gives us that competitive advantage. Over the next 15 years or 14 years from now, uh, the 20% tariff will be re completely reduced down to zero. We are now at 17.3% and in a couple more years we should see 
uh, more processed valve being exported directly from New Zealand to its current main market of South Korea. The other achievement that occurred over the season was that the Korea, uh, Korean government abolished the, uh, the excise tax on velvet, um, formerly known as Special Excise Tax or, or SET. This came off in two tranches, so the first lot, about a third of it, or a third of it, came off um, on the 27th of August, and the rest of it came off on the 1st of July. Again, this was an awesome thing to happen uh, going through our season. And I should note that, um, that this was, you know, this occurred for all imported velvet, it wasn't just New Zealand, and it was probably a little bit more meaningful today than, uh, than what the FTA had in terms of the season that we've just seen uh, by removing a total cost of about 10.1% of getting velvet into the markets. So that's the season we've just had. And it was pretty good, but if you'd asked most of the exporters in the room, they'd be pretty happy to see the back of it. Despite the positive uh, prices that we received, and again, positive prices for seven years running, it was bloody hard work. So on to my next se section, which is risks. Although we are experiencing a really good uh, period, seven years in the velvet industry, we have a few key risks that we need to be very mindful of. And in my opinion, these risks appear to be only intensifying. The three key risks I want to discuss today are supply side risks, so overproduction. Secondly, market concentration, and that's being overly reliant on one core sector of the market. And thirdly, increasing re regulatory hurdles, which could be the non-tariff non type trade barriers. So for supply side risks, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to any velvet producer in this room because it's probably been one of the most talked about topics in my discussions with producers over the last few years. This will come, yeah. This is an issue that's really started raising um, since, since the velvet industry started to rebuild around about four or five years ago. And consume will only increase when you look at this graph here showing velvet production came in at the end of last year at about 572 tonnes, up from 485 the previous year. But we need to be mindful of, of global supply and demand, and that picture has also been changing. By our estimation, as of today, the global supply and demand is in relative balance. But this could change, and it's something that we need to be very mindful of. As I said last year, we know that demand is growing, but so is supply. And if supply growth grows faster than demand growth, we could become a little bit unstuck. It's important to keep in mind our competitive cost advantage. So my key message, if, if, if there's nothing else you can take home from, from my presentation today, is, is just don't, please don't overcapitalize. The second risk are commodity traders. Now, one of the reasons for the volatility that was experienced some eight to ten plus years ago was an over-reliance or market concentration on a few buyers within one market. In those days, it was over 85%. And while that dependence has largely reduced, we're still, we're still um, far too exposed with over 50% of New Zealand's velvet traded in such a way. By the nature of commodity traders' business models, some traders profit from volatility, and this volatility is in direct conflict with our industry goals. Last year, while the market indicators were pointing towards continued stability that we eventually achieved, there was a significant downward price pressure from an important customer group of our market. As I've mentioned, New Zealand exporters had to work incredibly hard to combat this and to achieve the prices that they got. There are some traders or some importers that focus on long-term value, and we need to make sure we partner with those that add value to New Zealand Velvet and share in our common direction. Common direction seems to be another theme that seems to be coming out of this, um, out of this conference as well. The third key risks are regulatory hurdles. These are non-tariff type barriers, and these trade barriers can cut through existing, um, existing agreements such as free trade agreements and, and what have you, and they're really put into place to protect the country's um, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary, protect a country's um, uh, food safety, uh, protect a country's um, uh, cultural aspects as well. So Mike Peterson, he touched on these types of, um, these types of barriers this morning and I see them only, only potentially increasing. Now some of you might be um, interested to know that New Zealand, that we have a number of these types of regulatory hurdles 
for, um, for countries trying to export to us. And they're in place because of our biosecurity, our Treaty of Waitangi and other, other places, other uh, mechanisms in place. So it's, it's not just a one-way thing, but we need to be quite mindful that it does really impact the, the markets that we're trying to export New Zealand velvet to. Sometimes non-tariff barriers can be interpreted as unfair, and all of you guys will remember um, one example of exporting New Zealand apples to Australia. Non-tariff barriers are raised uh, on a regular occurrence, and I expect this to increase to only really increase, particularly in Asia, as, uh, as they increase their focus on improving food safety, both domestically and from imported foods. Fortunately, New Zealand's high health status in our farming environment, our strict regulatory compliance, which is favoured by um, overseas regulators, well, in our, yeah. However, that doesn't mean we aren't immune to the impacts of, the, of potential regulatory barriers. In fact, Sweeping changes with swift implementation can catch many New Zealand products out without intending to. So we at Deer Industry New Zealand must maintain a close relationship with our regulators and be prepared to accept there could be some requirements that could change the way that we take our products to market. So to summarise the three key risks, firstly, is global consumption outpacing global supply, or around the other way. Secondly, we need to ensure that, ensure that we are working with, with people in the market that can add value uh, to our velvet. And thirdly, we need to closely monitor and address regulatory hurdles that may impact the New Zealand velvet industry. So that's the end of my risks section and on to the final but certainly the largest part of my presentation, opportunities. Looking forward. And this section is about creating and maximising opportunities. So firstly, to create opportunities, we need clear market access. Without good market access and a clear regulatory pathway, it's a, uh, um, it significantly reduces our ability to proudly sell and promote New Zealand Velvet's key benefits. And for Velvet, as with most primary products produced in New Zealand, the New Zealand provenance is a key benefit. I talked earlier about the uh, improved market access in Korea with the free trade agreement and the abolishment of special excise tax on Velvet, and the second really important market that we're achieving exciting market access uh, improvements to is China. By using the experience we've learned in South Korea in the Healthy Food Channel, it gives us a clear focus that this is the channel we should target in China. However, there were hurdles with how velvet was being imported to China and its possible use as a health food ingredient. It meant it was difficult to celebrate its provenance and the benefits that were associated with that, so we've been working hard to unravel and better understand the regulatory pathways that would better enable us to position New Zealand's velvet in a category that gives us or maximises our long-term value. Last year, there was a slight change in the regulation that enabled velvet that is recognised under the Chinese pharmacopoeia to be imported as a food instead of as an agricultural byproduct. Species interpretation has been a significant stumbling block for years, and Deer Industry New Zealand we've put forward many arguments um, to, to be considered, or for New Zealand velvet and Chinese velvet to be considered under the um, Chinese pharmacopoeia. Well, last year we identified the government agency that is responsible for classifications around the importation of traditional Chinese medicine ingredients. And we managed to get a meeting with them late last year, uh, and we certainly followed their very helpful advice. So Deer Industry New Zealand, along with a key exporter, uh, got a couple of sticks of velvet exported over to an approved government lab uh, which tested as 100% Malu velvet, which is the velvet recognised under the Chinese pharmacopoeia. This was significant. It provides us the confidence, it provides, pro provided the confidence that we needed to, um, to promote to health food companies to investigate New Zealand velvet and its ingredients. There is a long way to go from a commercial standpoint, but we have cracked a significant regulatory hurdle. Once we've created opportunities, we need to maximise them, and that sits with market development and premium positioning, which you'll remember from Dan's presentation yesterday as one of the key, the key themes of the new Deer Industry New Zealand strategy. Market development and premium positioning for international markets is best done um, through, through key relationships up into the market, and that ties us really nicely into this year's conference theme, Proud Partnerships. For the velvet industry, or for the velvet market, 
Our industry's um, proud partnerships are obviously focused on the traditional, the oriental medicine doctor sector, and increasingly so in the healthy food sector. For the oriental medicine doctor sector, there has been a real emergence of the next generation, of the newer generation of OMD suppliers. These suppliers are keen, to, or marketers are keen to promote New Zealand Velvet. And I'm going to go through and talk about three, very, very quickly cover three um, examples of new young generation marketers that are coming through the system in that traditional supply side. Each of these uh, companies import in, in the tens of tonnes, so they're not small and they can be quite meaningful to our business. These marketers have a value-added focus and are often really innovative. So the example I've got here, um, we've got this, this new guy, this, well, this guy has taken over from his father that was one of the traders um, in the old Jackie Dong market. He's built brand new factories. He's got a really nice proactive sales force. Um, but from an innovative point of view, he set up his, um, his own online um, marketing platform that Oriental Medicine doctors can go online, they can uh, identify the velvet that they're keen on purchasing and place the order. Once they press click, uh, there's a photograph of that velvet, it's the, weight, the weight is taken, and then it's sliced in a really innovative way. So it's sliced um, in, a, in, in a long way and can be almost reconstituted back into that stick, and you can have a look at the, at the jelly tip all, all the way through. So it is, it is really innovative. These new generation marketers are quality driven, with new factories built to GMP standard and impressive showrooms with proactive marketing teams, vastly different from the medicine markets of only just a few years ago. And this is um, a picture of uh, the entry towards Jackie Dong market, our biggest market for oriental medicine. So, so they've changed considerably. And these next generation love to promote the New Zealandness of their velvet. This is probably our most closest partner in the OMD sector, a company called OmniHerb, which you've probably heard me speak about many times. They have, for a long time, sold the most expensive velvet to oriental medicine doctors, and they only sell New Zealand velvet. They are effective at promoting their point of difference and are able to talk about the New Zealand story with pride. I walked into a meeting room expecting to meet with the beer or Nam Ho Kim, only a few weeks ago, and, uh, and he opened up the boardroom and there were 20 of his sales force all sitting around a table going through this promotion. It was almost, it could have been staged. And the beer, as he's affectionately known as, said, come on, Reese, stand up and sell us New Zealand Velvet. They were eager and attentive and wanted to get out there and grow their business for the coming season. I'm now going to play you a quick clip from another marketer's upcoming campaign. And this is very much a draft, but you'll get the general picture as this is a small, so there's still changes to be made to this, uh, and thanks to David Morgan and, and uh, Tony. Um, so this is a very small taste of their story to promote New Zealand Velvet. Aotearoa, Māori족의 언어로 희고 긴 구름의 땅이란 뜻이다. 그 희고 긴 구름의 땅을 우린 뉴질랜드라 부른다. 청정 뉴질랜드. 우리에겐 너무나 익숙한 이미지다. 이 다큐멘터리는 동물성 생약 전문 기업인 한동어부의 녹용 부분에 있어 양질의 녹용을 공급하기 위해 산지를 직접 방문하고 있고 또한 생생한 정보를 고객에게 전달하기 위해 제작되었으며 이 프로젝트를 위해 뉴질랜드 녹용 사업을 주도적으로 이끌어 가고 있는 기관, 회사와 전문가들에게 인터뷰를 요청했었으며 그들은 흔쾌히 I think there'd been a bit of rain at, at Raincliffe. So there's still a bit of editing to be done, but you can just get the general picture. Selling New Zealand in, in, in Asia is becoming absolutely um, uh, or positively infectious. The final segment in market development is focused on the healthy food channel and the few companies that we're working closely with are increasing their sales of New Zealand velvet. And, and we're starting to work with, with companies with a really attractive brand names as well. So you'll remember, or for those people that were at last year's conference, you'll remember our invited guest, Dr Chung from KGC. He talked about the 19th product that they had just launched that contained New Zealand velvet and that was a product called Chong Nok Sam. Chong Nok Sam went on to become one of the most successful launches 
Already by conference last year, it had reached their first initial full year target, the full year target being a calendar year. By year end, it had more than doubled their budget, and it's a product that retails for around about New Zealand, uh, around about 500 bucks a month. And it's on track for another really successful season, reaching 42% of its full year budget this year by, the, by the, um, the end of Lunar New Year, which is at the end of February. So it's looking pretty good. So this is the, um, cam or the integrated campaign that they ran, or just parts of it that they ran last year to, um, uh, during its launch. They ran a whole lot of social media clips. They sponsored a um, women's netball team, or volleyball team, sorry, in, um, in Korea. Uh, they won a prestigious packaging award, global packaging award in Hamburg uh, in December uh, of last year, and also they had quite a bit of product placement in a, in a famous Korean drama. As I said, this was their 19th product, and here is an earlier one launched a few, only a few years ago which, uh, which contains New Zealand Velvet and reached $50 million worth of sales last year. Now, as I said, I'm going to break, um, break my, section up, my session up into, up into two, and I thought as a bit of fun and to try and encourage uh, a bit of interaction with everyone that I, I brought a, a couple of boxes of these along today. Each one of these... They're a, they're a little ginseng ball that contains velvet. Each one of these retails for about 50 US bucks. Um, so they gave them to us as, a, um, uh, as an example of what they sell. And I'm going to give one of these out to each one, each person as they ask a question to, uh, to see what their response is when they try it. If they're difficult questions, you might just want to check the expiry date on them. We do have another food company that uh, we've also got a close relationship with, and it has also achieved significant success over the past um, over the past year. It's following a similar path to KGC, and over the last year, its velvet requirements went from eight tons to 27 tons, following a joint promotional campaign that Dairy Industry New Zealand ran with them. Again, you can see the New Zealand provenance featuring heavily in their promotional campaign. So you've got these types of companies that are growing; they're growing very fast and they love selling New Zealand velvet. So this brings me to the final point in my presentation, product integrity. There is little doubt that the New Zealand velvet brand has strengthened in the minds of our customers. And as the brand strengthens, so does the incentive to copy or misrepresent it. For a few years now, we've had requests from companies or associations like the Association of Korea and Orange Medicine to better put mechanisms in, in place to safeguard our product integrity and better assure um, the New Zealandness, I guess, of our velvet. And the recent connection that we've had with a healthy food company and sophisticated modern corporates has also given us, or they've also requested um, more rigour around the product authenticity of New Zealand velvet. Country of origin programs in general are becoming recent, uh, more and more popular in the Asian, Asia region. So the season before last, we conducted a proof of concept on a country of origin system with one OMD company. The feedback from the company, its customers, and, and indeed its competitors, was so positive that we've actually just rolled it out to one or two other food companies and OMD companies. It's a pretty rudimentary system, to be fair. The, uh, um, there's, a, there's a mark that we supply these, uh, these companies with individual unique numbers, but it gives us the ability to work really closely with these um, partners, with these in-market partners, and make sure that we feel confident that we can match up their supply and what they're bringing in and what they're selling. And so de the Deer Industry New Zealand website or our office based up there will release a whole lot of numbers that the customer can go in, enter these numbers into the, the, um, the DIN's website, and it'll come up saying, that this, the product contained within in this, has met the process um, that has been approved by Deer Industry New Zealand to better assure product quality. As I've said, uh, you know, the Country of Origin program has, has a huge amount of benefits as it creates more direct and transparent connection between the New Zealand supplier and its market intended for consumption. It creates a real pride in selling New Zealand velvet and actually by its own, own existence implies value. As I said, the promotional trial continues in Korea and we've signed up a couple of more marketers in both the OMD and the Healthy Food Channels. Now some of you may recognise this brand and can therefore share in the excitement of where we're going in this important healthy food sector. The country of origin pr promotion is a very low level promotion, but our intention is to perfect it and then look to roll it out into 
into China as for the first time now we're starting to get marketers and companies keen to promote New Zealand velvet in China. All in all, I've talked about a fantastic opportunity in front of us, but please don't forget about the risks, particularly the finely balanced supply and demand situation. The New Zealand velvet industry is really dynamic, it's full of awesome people, and, and I do truly think that it's a, it's a bright industry to be a part of. Thanks very much. I'd, um, I just, oh, uh, what, could, could, uh, could, well, we could either answer some questions now, save it for the panel if you like, Grant, or? <laughs> yeah, you might, you might stay sitting down and go up to the next leg, I'm not too sure, but, um, okay. Um, can I please ask Tony Cochran, uh, Colin Stevenson, Ross Chambers to, to come up here, and then, um, then I'll be happy to take some questions. Um, as I say, there's a, there's a wee little incentive. I'd love to get your feedback on this. It's, it's heavily ginseng, um, but also with some premium New Zealand velvet in it. So if I could just ask um, yeah, Rob and Kenwin to take a couple of those and they can fire them out to, um, to people as they ask questions. Um, can I also ask Dan to come up. Dan will moderate the, um, the panel because uh, I'll sit down and take questions, obviously. Who wants the first ball? Tanner. You've got to eat it first. <laughs> I've got manners, I don't talk with my mouth full. Um, just a, a question for um, some of the um, um, practitioners here to, this afternoon. Um, three quarters of our family actually use um, velvet in one tablet or form of another. Um, any ideas on the growing use of it in New Zealand? Um, so where's that question coming from? Oh, yeah. Janet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, great question, and we don't have those figures. I'm sorry. We monitor um, export stats. Uh, we monitor export stats, and um, uh, but we don't we don't know how 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 much it's grown. We do know that velvet in New Zealand is consumed at a really low low level, comparing comparing with um, uh, with Korea and China, but we don't know how how quickly it's growing. Um, we all know that um, the supply of New Zealand velvet is increasing um, and, and we have the figures for, for what that is in the last year and um, and probably can't put a, you could probably have a guess at what, the, what it is for this for this season that's wound up. But um, my question to, to, to all of you is, uh, uh, on the panel is, what's your, what sort of level of percentage do we need going into the healthy functional food market to, to align because, I mean, we can obviously grow as an industry as long as we get the balance right going into the healthy functional food market from what we're hearing. So as a percentage basis, is, um, how, what, what are those sort of numbers of how much we need to grow with that, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, good question, Grant. Uh, so obviously 25%, or I don't know if I mentioned that before, but we would estimate about 25% now goes into, um, into the healthy food or value-added type market. Um, and that's really awesome compared with a few years ago when it was less than one percent. So it's growing. It's growing fast. Um, you know, does it need to be at fifty percent? You know, possibly. We don't really. We don't know what that magic points. You know, where that magic percentage point is. We do know that we need to lessen the reliance on commodity traders that are currently over fifty percent. So one of the things I'd also like to get across is not just about the food guys. But the key message I was trying to get across with those three examples I used in the um, Orange Medicine Doctors, they're so different than their fathers of old that just sat down there smoking, drinking, and, and, and traded in velvet. These guys, they're, they're university educated, um, they're branding themselves, they're tying themselves in with the, both the Country of Origin program and other things for New Zealand velvet. And so it's not just the healthy food, but it's also these programs that we're working with with some of the new generation OMD marketers as well that's going to lessen that reliance because they, if they, if they um, market as New Zealand velvet, they've got to buy it from New Zealand. You've answered it all. <laughs> no, um, I'd like to say probably 50% or north of there um, for the functional food market. As Rhys said, there is also a traditional sector that um, is starting to do new innovative things. Um, we've got competitive tension within companies in Korea and also China, so that's something to remember too, that um, we can't be singled out to one market or one particular sector. We've got to have that tension or that competition there um, to keep each other honest. 
um, that's that's the key to, I suppose, uh, driving price forward as well. Just another point to add. Um, we always think hard about how big the pie is and, and whether it's growing. Um, and I think uh, there could be some sort of transference in terms of the consumer from older consumers who are taking it in a traditional fashion to younger consumers who are taking it in this very exciting and, and developing modern sector. Does that mean that the, the consumption is growing? No, arguably it probably doesn't. But I think New Zealand is so well placed to, to develop this sort of new type of business. That's why it's really exciting for us. But it's contestable whether the pie itself is actually getting bigger. Another one up the back. Uh, Reese or the panel. Um, during the venison section, we, uh, there's a lot said about um, environmental and uh, the issue that played. And from the velvet point of view, from your new OMDs, um, where does the uh, importance placed on animal welfare and environmental issues? Is that quite high on there? <laughs> I, I, you know, um, so animal welfare, I think, is increasing, um, particularly in more sophisticated markets like uh, like Korea. Um, probably, you know, as of today, it's not such an important factor in China, but it will do so. Um, so I think animal welfare is becoming um, more more understood. Um, from an environmental point of view, that's that's a key part of what we sell. Um, you know, one of the big companies that one of these guys deal with, one of the big food companies, they use a the slogan, healthy deer, happy deer, and therefore, you know, they, they have great products. So um, that's what they really see of, of, New, you know, of New Zealand, the, the environment side of things. So, um, so animal welfare, increasing in its importance, and certainly in the sophisticated markets, um, and we'll do so in the, our emerging market. And from an environmental standpoint, it's some, something that we absolutely sell um, that clean green New Zealand. I've got one over there, then Graham. Um, Rob, if you. Oh, just going back to your slide there earlier, you had consumption in China at about 575, and yet Korea was 600. Given what you said about the uh, growth in that middle class going from up to 25,000. It, what sort of budget are you looking for the China consumption to grow at? I'll, I'll just repeat that question if that's okay. So, the vel um, so what type of budget are we doing for the China market? Yeah, you know, where's our sort of forecast? Where's our thoughts? Um, so, China at the moment, we're estimating. Is there, and these are estimations. We're estimating to be about 575. Um, and, and Korea is about 600 tonnes. Most of the Korean guys actually know that China is going to overtake them very rapidly if they haven't already in terms of velvet consumption. Where's the growth? Um, do you want to answer that, Colin? China? Yeah, in China. If we are lucky enough to actually crack, as Rhys said earlier on, the regulatory hurdles that we've got there, the growth in China must come from the health food sector. If you, if you have a look on uh, Google, it actually, it shows you the huge increase in demand for, for vitamin supplements, all kinds of supplements actually in China, and the acceptance or really growing acceptance in, in the younger generation and middle class people in using it. There's, there's one company that Reese and I have been studying that's, using, that's selling around 17 billion US dollars worth of health food products in China. If you get your head around that, $17 billion is massive. We're not dealing with industries in Korea or China that talk about those levels. That company's got 20,000 retail outlets. So if you can get product positioned in those kind of markets, then that's where your future growth, I think, comes from and your stabilities. Uh, Graham? Um, yeah, you showed us the guy trying to push a rock up a hill um, and you told me or told us that it was a very hard season last year and you and obviously you did a good job holding the line and selling well. Uh, obviously a bit concerning, we've got more product. Um, why was it such a hard season last year? Why were these guys playing hardball? And how do we, you know, what's the forecast for the coming season in view of that? Uh, position they're taking? Well, Graham, I guess you've answered half your own questions. 
How many extra tons of velvet did you produce last year? Three or four? One. One. Okay, so that's what, 10% of, of your herd went up in production? If we put that right across the whole industry, that's another 50 or 60 or 70 tons of product that everybody's expecting us guys to try and sell for you and maintain value. It's not an easy task. Reese actually had it quite right when he said that rock's been really hard to push up the hill. If we go back three years ago when we had 450 tonnes of product that we were dealing with, it actually wasn't that big a challenge. But we approached 600 tonnes 12 months ago. We don't actually know what the final figure was for the season that's completed now, or nearly completed now. But my guess is that it's higher than the previous year. If you look at the growth in the health food sector, which is the one thing we've been hanging our hats on, if we're honest about it in the industry, it, it almost doubled in a year. So from 50 tonne to 100 tonne means you've had a 50 tonne increase in, in sale in that sector. We heard Ross just say before that a lot of that, has, a lot of that extra consumption in that sector has probably been taken up by people that have gone to a ready-to-consume ready product to the traditional stuff that could take you five or six hours to boil up in your home. So we've probably moved the people from traditional to modern. What we haven't seen is the growth that we need to keep consuming this extra, produc extra production that we're bringing on. Tony or Ross want to add, add to that answer at all? Or? Thank you. Um, another point that's worth everyone considering is that the buying style of your traditional velvet I won't call it a trader, but an importer, has been recently, over the last five or six years, send out money in an aggressive fashion to source product. Now, if we're shifting, as we are, to these health food companies, modern style of buying, it isn't like that. They want to pay for it when they get it. So if we're looking to have stable prices at something akin to the levels we've enjoyed for the last four or five years, there may need to be a greater level of patience about when product is moved so that prices can be maintained. That's, I think, something that's important to consider. All right. Uh, next one, Rob, you've got uh, Bill down there. Right. Well, I was formulating this question and had my hand up when Colin hadn't said anything, and I thought it would be good to hear from him. But unfortunately, he's been hit a bit. But you um, yesterday expressed some concerns, and um, I wondered whether you'd like to expand on the ones around Palm Kernel now, when I ask the second part of this question, you can, de can decide whether you just want to give that a very short answer. But um, my limited understanding is I thought we'd developed some sort of a DNA-type um, test that could prove um, the authenticity of New Zealand velvet. And probably the question comes a wee bit that if we've got large lots of um, uh, overseas food being used um, in the velvet production, would that affect that DNA testing? And um, also, um, we hear about healthy foods, and I may have a few um, misguided reservations about palm kernel, but I don't see them fitting quite together. But um, I appreciate if you're not happy with the question, there's a pretty simple answer, because I did say, would you like to expand on the comments you made yesterday? So, so Rhys, would you maybe just expand on the, the verification plans we have in place for the Country of Origin program? Um, well, two, I mean, two, yeah, so two ways. I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit about that, but then come back to you, Colin, to expand the question. Testing will cover that. Yeah. So, um, uh, so one of, you know, I talked about this country of origin system that, that we're excited about rolling out and it adds value to, to the New Zealand Velvet brand and everything like that. Um, actually, one of the audit tools that we're looking to implement with that is this isotopic isotopic signature verifying um, technology that, as you'd remember, Deer Industry New Zealand invested in this technology quite a few years ago, and, we, and um, during our sort of proof of concept, we found quite discriminating factors between carbon and sulphur, and I think probably a lot of New Zealand's profile and primary products would show that, um, just with our unique landscape. Um, in terms of what type of impact that parts, you know, feeding them overseas foods, yes, it probably will have some type of impact. Um, we need to perfect this tool for, um, for auditing, and it's going to take us quite a few months to have a look at that, and maybe we should factor in some, some palm kernel, but there are other aspects around the, um, around the environmental uh, aspects that can help um, with the profile of, um, uh, of the um, isotopes 
that, that, are, that we're looking for. I don't expect it to change a lot, but it's something we should be quite mindful of. So I think that's, that's a good question, but I might now just pass it back to Colin to finish the answer. Yes, yeah. you're doing so good. You're, you're happy, Colin? <laughs> Bill, I, I'm not sure whether or not I should answer the question. But if you think it through, the three of us guys sitting up here, generally we're clean green New Zealand. We're a pasture fed, sometimes grain supplements and, and seasonal needs industry. What, what we've got to be careful of is that something else doesn't come along and shoot us in the backside. In particular because we're going down this path of health food supplementary sales. We have to be careful that if people start testing our products before they buy it from us, that we can actually meet the requirements of what they want. So that's why I'm cautioning people about the use of, of other additives in, in their feeds. Because I know in some sectors that there are some additives that are used in, in the pork industry in China, as an example, that would, would really horrify you if you actually saw it. So we, we, that's just why I'm cautioning people. Be careful of it. Don't overdo it. Oh. Done. John. Oh, not John. Sorry. Uh, my question is, um, with a huge number of uh, Chinese tourists now coming into New Zealand, do you see, or any of you see, opportunities to um, um, market and grow that um, velvet tourism in New Zealand? I think that's a no. <laughs> yeah, there are actually um, companies in New Zealand that have been specialising in it for many years. If you go to Rotorua, there's Supreme Nat Natural Products, Hopo Kin, Dr. Hopo Kin. He's been really active in trying to promote New Zealand um, deer products, promote New Zealand tourism. He actually he, he hosted with the Chinese Premier when he came out to New Zealand the last time. So it's actually occurring and, and probably people don't realise it. Yeah, I think my answer was a bit glib, but these guys are exporters um, and there is, a, I guess, a, a smaller cottage industry in New Zealand. Every, you go to the airport these days and every Chinaman's lining up to buy um, honey and we've, I see a huge opportunity in that um, within New Zealand. Yep, I, I guess the, I mean, no, no argument, but as per venison and, and, and a whole lot of other primary products, that just the size of the market means that we are always going to be heavily reliant on exports and whether we can turn that, what's a cottage industry, into something more significant. Quite, quite possibly. We heard Silver Fern talk about, you know, 90 tonne of venison sold in New Zealand, which is a good good little market, but it's always going to be, at best, a good little market. So, certainly, Richard, the feedback I'm getting from um, from the guys that operate in that area is that it's growing, and, and that's brilliant, you know, when you're reading about the increasing number, but it's, it wouldn't, it's not going to change our industry, um, but it's, it is great for those guys that are selling more velvet to overseas uh, Chinese tourists, particularly. We're, we're, gonna, we're running out of time again, run out of time again, but we've got John, who's been waiting patiently. Uh, my question is to yourself, Dan, or, or Reese there. Um, just in terms of the investment that we as levy payers have made over many years in the research of velvet and understanding the virtues of what velvet can do us as a health product, um, I'm just interested to know just where we're at with that research and how confidently myself or anyone else in this room can talk about uh, velvet, say, as a wound, wound healing uh, product, as we've uh, learned a lot of it, Repair X as an example. Similar, uh, because I'm listening to the stories that you're hearing from the Manuka honey people and they're really driving it and doing very well, talking about and expounding exactly the same virtues that I've been accustomed to talking about velvet. How confidently can we be in the future? Yeah, thank, thanks very much, John. We're, we're just about out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's an absolutely fair question and as I said very briefly, too briefly yesterday, I'm, I'm pretty embarrassed about the answer. So, so, I mean, the, the deer industry, as I see it, saw the Manuka Honey, and particularly the company Convita, as, as a real model to follow in terms of 
how we could uh, get velvet into the mainstream Western, you know, uh, medicine system. Um, so, you know, the, the industry has been going down that track. In, in the meantime, to be fair, the, our strategy has moved back to traditional markets where there is huge demand and consumption, and it doesn't need to be proven in a pharmaceutical setting. Um, but nonetheless, the RepairX project um, continues to be on the books. Um, I stood up in front of conference um, last year and said, I think that trial is about to start. So, you know, the next step on that process is a first in humans trial at, at Middlemore Hospital. So, a actually, the, the trial did start very shortly after I told you that. Um, so the trial's been open for about 10 months and, and waiting for the patients to come through who have the right size of uh, donor site of uh, skin graft um, to be, you know, given, you know, a, 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 a control substance on half and, and the repair X on the other half. Um, but, but they haven't come. So if anyone feels like applying any hot water to themselves, so, yeah, I'd be very grateful. Um, but we're, we're at, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly frustrated and embarrassed by that, that lack of process. And, and we're at the stage, you know, the board's pretty hot on this too, and they're asking me for some, um, some answers. So what, why has this not, not happened and, and what's plan B? So what do we do next? So I, I'm, I'm really pretty frustrated and I don't have a good answer for you, John. But um, we, we will, you know, at the moment, at our, um, we're pretty determined to see it through. So, so move, moving on from Repairx, so we, we are still spending money in research and um, yeah, one of the probably bigger projects that we can be quite excited and, and happy about is, um, so, so the nature of the research has changed a little bit, we're, we're working with, um, with people in the market uh, a little bit more, so, um, uh, so there's one company that we're looking to try and get, help their product get registered in China. Um, which will provide a bit of a beachhead around the types of things that we've just talked about in that regulatory space. Um, but also, you know, I talked about the success of a couple of those big pro, um, products um, that happened with, with KGC, and Stephen's been over and had meetings with their researchers, and um, there's been sort of lots of activities that have been happening uh, with some of the um, with some of the people that can better commercialise or better, you know, you, you uptake some of the research. So there is some research that's, that's happening in that area that, that's being more immediately commercialised. Right. I'm going to have to uh, kill it off guys as we're, um, we're out of time.